Okay, good morning everybody. A uh, few announcements here at the beginning. So, um, we're not. There we go. All right, so homework six, due Thursday by 9.30 in the morning. Uh, this was a long assignment, so if you haven't started it yet, um, good luck with that. Uh, assignments for next class are to read 29.1 and 29.2, and I have a video for you to watch to accompany that. I, it occurred to me as I was editing this one that I had completely forgot to give you this one. Uh, it has to do with, it clarifies forces on loops of current, magnetic dipole moments, and things like that. So you can go back and, and look through that. It's about 40 minutes, but it's just going through stepwise, going through the calculation of how you calculate the torque on a loop of current. So if you're comfortable with that, you don't have to worry about it. If you're not, you want to see, you know, painfully going through each step to get the, the total effect, then, then go for it. Uh, yeah, so uh, team meetings. All right, so the ice apocalypse screwed up at least one team's two scheduled team meetings. They had to be scheduled and rescheduled and it was canceled again. So um, uh, the team's are Jillian. So your team is going to get at least an hour if you want it. Okay. So what I need the lead editors to do is as soon as possible let me know what times your team can meet for 30 minutes starting uh, this Thursday and going through next Friday. All right. And if we have to go a little bit past that, that's, that's fine. If we have to go into the next week, but I'd like to get another meeting in before we close out, um, well, too much of March. I mean, April 1st is next Wednesday. So, uh, any questions? Okay, all right, well, if not, then let's get this quiz over with, and then we can move on to more interesting questions regarding the quiz. Okay, so magnets, how do those effing things work, right? Uh, we're about to learn that, actually. Magnets are really quite fascinating. I mean, you probably, how many of the, how many people played with magnets when they were younger or continue to play with them now. Okay, great. Thank you, Jerry. For, okay, thank you, courageous people, for having them. It's okay. I'm outing you as people who play with magnets now. That's okay. Um, so these are just all, you know, cheap refrigerator magnets. You saw me messing around with these in the lecture videos. Um, you know, why, why is it that they exert this seemingly permanent force on each other or on materials that can be so-called magnetized, uh, like iron, certain kinds of iron can be susceptible to the influence of a magnetic field. This is a very mysterious force. It's an old force. It's probably the first one we really came to recognize after gravity. I mean, after all, people fall down a lot when they're young, so gravity is one of the first forces you become familiar with. That and, you know, the, the ground, which doesn't feel good when you fall. Magnets are an old thing, but they were only understood in the mid to late 1800s. And in fact, understanding them requires an understanding of electricity. Magnetism essentially gets its origins from the momentum of charge. Any kind of momentum possessed by a charged particle is capable of generating a magnetic field. Uh, the one we'll study is motion itself, so real physical motion, which all of us can understand. But there's a deeper kind of momentum that every particle has uh, inside of it that can't be changed as far as we know. And that's something called its spin. So how many of you have ever heard of spin angular momentum or spin? Okay, in what context have you heard of spin before? Jerry? Uh, not a, well, quantum mechanics, but also like chemistry. Chemistry. Yeah, chemistry is really just applied, I, I love saying this, chemistry is just applied quantum mechanics and electricity. That's really about it. So. Um, yeah, that really demeans an entire field of study right there, okay? I mean, just add another electron, change its chemical properties, how very exciting for you, right? So, um, yeah, okay, great. Um, you can all tell uh, all the folks in chemistry I said that if you like. Uh, I've already used the equipment I need from them this month anyway, so I got what I needed. All right, so uh, there is an irreducible little bit of, it turns out to be angular momentum inside every particle, uh, except one that we know of. Uh, every particle in nature has a little irreducible bit of angular momentum. And as far as we know, all the stuff that makes up matter, so for instance, uh, protons, neutrons, electrons, they all have spin one half. And that one half is a multiple of the tiniest amount of angular momentum anything can have in the cosmos, as far as we know. So they get this, this little half unit of angular momentum. So they're called spin one half particles, and rightly so in chemistry. The fact that electrons have spin a half means you can't put them all in the same energy levels in the same way. 
Uh, one of them, for instance, has to have their spin pointing one way, and the other one has to have their spin pointing the other. And then, for instance, in the lowest level energy shell, that's considered to be a filled shell. And if you want to pile more electrons into that atom, you've got to put them at higher orbits. And so that's actually just quantum mechanics written out in sort of a cartoon picture of, of atoms. So you actually learn quantum mechanics inadvertently when you're learning chemistry. You just don't realize it perhaps until much, much later. Um, it's the little irreducible pieces of angular momentum inside of atoms that creates this permanent force that we see here. Um, you can get rid of it. Does anybody know how to get rid of the magnetism in a material? Some kind of mechanical thing, actually hitting it. Yeah. yeah. What you want to do is the the reason that these these uh, these uh, things are magnetic is that some fraction of their atoms all have their spin angular momentum pointing in the same direction, and when that happens, you get a net magnetic field from it. Okay. And you'll see why that is as we go into the next few sections of the course. So all you have to do is hit the material really hard to randomize the spin orientation. So just bang it with a hammer, basically. So if you ever accidentally magnetize a screwdriver, which can happen, um, you just have to hit it against a table. Don't break the screwdriver, don't break the table, okay? And don't tell your parents I told you to do that with their nice screwdriver, all right? Um, these are pretty dinky magnets. I mean, as things go, there's not a whole lot going on in, in these. And I'm going to put them safely away from me. This thing is much more dangerous. So this is a rare earth magnet. And it's not going to look like much. But this is a ridiculously strong magnet. If I had another rare earth magnet near me, I would have to be very careful that they don't get too close or I could break a finger. Uh, if you get in the way of two rare earth magnets when they come together, uh, pain will ensue. So at the very least, a blood blister, and at the very worst, a broken finger. Okay? So these are, these are rough. These are strong. In terms of Teslas, the units of magnetic field strength, okay? Uh, you know, the Earth's magnetic field has strengths of the order of tens of millitesla. These are more like order tenths of a tesla or tesla. So it kind of depends on how close you are to the magnet and, and so forth. But these are, these are big honking magnets. Uh, they're made from rare earth elements, uh, which, you know, is an interesting topic these days because China has most of the rare earth element deposits that are known about in the world, which makes them a leader in production and sales of rare earth elements, which are essential to modern electronics, magnets, and things like that. All right, so that creates an interesting geopolitical dynamic, uh, all based around rare earth elements, like the kinds you'll find in these, like neodymium, for instance, which you'll find in magnets like this. Okay, so I'm going to use this rare earth magnet to a purpose today. But before I do that, let's go through the quiz questions, and then we'll uh, we'll see how that we'll see how that works out. Okay, so answers to the quiz questions. All right, so which of these is true about an electric current in the presence of an external magnetic field? So you have a current, and it's traveling in the presence of an external magnetic field. Is it, one, the current will always move in a circle in the presence of an external magnetic field? Okay, two, the current will experience a force if any component of its motion, length vector, is perpendicular at a right angle to the magnetic field lines. So if you have B and any component of the current I points uh, in such a way that that component is perpendicular to the field that experiences a force. Anyone for that? Okay. The current will experience a force if any component of its motion length vector is parallel to along the magnetic field lines. That is, it, when the current, like say, the current is perfectly lined up with the field, it experiences the maximal force. No one. Okay. It's, it's Tuesday. All right. No force at all will be experienced by the current due to an external magnetic field. No one's committing to anything. Okay. <laughs> fine. Good for you. Way to play poker. All right. So the current will experience a force if any component is perpendicular. It's the same rule as for a single charge with a velocity vector. So a current is just made of a whole bunch of charges all moving in the same direction. And so you can apply the same rule. If any component of the velocity, if any component of the motion direction of the current is perpendicular to the magnetic field, it will experience a force from the magnetic field. Okay, the magnetic dipole moment, mu, the Greek letter mu, of a current loop is, one, the product of the current, I, traveling through each of n loops with the area enclosed by the current loop. So in other words, mu equals nin. Okay, some takers. The ratio of the current, I, traveling through each of n loops and the area enclosed by the current loop. So mu equals ni divided by a. No one? Okay. 
the product of the magnetic charge and the separation between the magnetic charges. So like the distance between the north and south poles times the strength of those north and south poles. Okay? The momentum of the charges in the current. Okay, all right, well, so very low commitment level on that one. It's one, the product of current, the number of loops of that current, and the area enclosed by the loops. And we'll, we'll use that, I, I hope, a little bit today. Okay, this is, uh, this is the an analogy to the electric dipole moment. And what you'll learn once we get into the next phase of magnetism, where we, we really begin to see how is it that a ele moving electric charge creates magnetic field, uh, you'll begin to see why it is that the simplest magnetic fields we know about are all dipole fields. Uh, it's, you'll see why it is that we don't <coughs> think there are any magnetic monopoles in nature, but there could be. We just haven't seen them. Okay. All right, so in the lecture video, what do we learn about the Earth? One, the quote-unquote north magnetic pole is really a south pole, if we think of Earth as a giant bar magnet, because compass needle north poles point toward it. Okay, two, the direction of the Earth's magnetic field periodically flips direction, weakening during the period when it flips. Okay, three, we are protected from electrically charged particles, the solar wind, raining down on Earth by its magnetic field, which deflects the particles, or four, all of the above. Okay, good, thank God. All right, so, <laughs> uh, yes, it's all of the above. Yeah, so all of those things are true as far as we know about the Earth. Because we define North Poles as being the things that point toward sort of essentially... Um, uh, uh, the north of the, 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 the north star, okay, if you will, uh, they must be lining up with a south magnetic pole. So the top of the earth up in the Arctic actually represents the, the south end of a giant bar magnet. Uh, and, you know, that magnet from the earth comes from a very specific process, which I think we'll have a problem on coming up in another homework assignment or so. All right. Uh, it does flip direction, leaving the Earth vulnerable to uh, a rain of cosmic rays, electrically charged particles, which can uh, cause genetic damage. So in principle, cancer rates will go up when this happens, and it's probably due to happen in the next thousand years or so. Could happen sooner, or when it happens, it seems to happen fast, maybe a century or two. Uh, it doesn't sound like a lot. That's like three human generations, uh, or two human generations, right, that it takes to, to do that. But, uh, but that's actually relatively fast on geological timescales. And uh, we are, in fact, protected from electrically charged particles by that, that magnetic field. So it funnels them toward the south and uh, the north and south poles of the Earth and keeps us uh, relatively at low levels of cosmic ray radiation, although this place is alive with cosmic rays right now. We could set up a cloud chamber in here and actually see them. So uh, I wanted to let you guys know what I was doing last week. So I mentioned I was going to a conference in Seattle. <coughs> Uh, this is the poster for the conference. It's called LRT 2015, Low Radioactivity <laughs> Techniques. It is the premier international conference for a community of, of experiments that are trying to measure extremely rare processes in nature. So uh, some people are looking for a very rare kind of nuclear decay called neutrinoless double beta decay. If we observe it, we'll be able to measure the mass of this elusive ghostly particle called the neutrino. We don't know that it really exists, but it's predicted to exist. So people are looking for it. But to, to make experiments like that, to make experiments that look for the dark matter that appears to make up 85% of the matter in the universe, requires very clean materials, uh, very uh, great amounts of shielding, and usually you have to put these things deep underground. So a lot of these experiments are being conducted in underground laboratories, like in old um, gold mines and things like that, okay? And that's across the globe. Uh, so, for instance, my spouse, Professor Cooley, works on a dark matter experiment. It's located currently in the Sudan Underground Laboratory. It's an old iron mine. It's moving to the Sudbury uh, 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 Underground Laboratory in Canada, which is a deeper mine, much cleaner, and uh, much more outfitted for doing big experiments. So, um, so, Dr. Cooley and I and two of our students went to this conference last week to present some work, which I thought maybe some of you would find interesting, so I'll, I'll mention just briefly what it is. One of the problems that you have when you're building clean experiments is radon. Radon is ubiquitous. It's, it's all around us, and it comes from uranium decays in the Earth. There's a lot of uranium, there's a lot of thorium in the Earth, so radon is everywhere. And if you dig into the Earth, like make a basement, like, you did, like we did in this building, if you go down into the basement, you take a radon detector with you, you'll find there's a higher amount of radon downstairs than in here, and less radon upstairs. Radon is heavy, it tends to sink, and anyway, it comes from the Earth itself, from the uranium and thorium that's just all around us, uh, so it seeps in through walls and things like that. The problem with radon 
is that it decays down to things with extremely long half-lives that if they implant in your detector materials will just sit there and radiate for 50 years. And if you're trying to build a really clean experiment that doesn't have a lot of noise from ambient radiation, this is a killer. You don't want this. So one of the things that people have recognized for a long time is that when uranium and thorium give you radon and the radon decays, the daughters of the radon are all electri electrically charged. And in fact, 85% of them are positively charged. <laughs> so you could imagine building a shield using an electric field. The question was, how big an electric field? And is it practical? So, uh, so one of the students and I, so Matthew Bremer, who's a dual engineering and physics major, uh, we embarked on a little project to do something that everyone talked about doing, but no one had actually done, and that was to measure the effect of an electric field on radon daughters. So um, on the cheap, uh, Professor Cooley had uh, worked with a teacher who had an engineering facility to build a bunch of little exposure chambers. They're just pressure cookers, so $20 Walmart pressure cookers. Drill a couple of holes in them, put in some connectors and gas fittings, and you can put a radon source inside of it, seal the lid, expose material, we used copper, uh, to the radon, and then try to mitigate the radon exposure. So you could try blowing air over the copper, or you could try putting it in the presence of a whopping great electric field. So half the project was moving nitrogen over it to try to get radon from sticking, just carry it away before it sticks, and the other half of the project was big electric field. So to do the electric field experiment, we have, there's the copper, little four inch by four inch squares. They're really quite pretty, and they're cut from a really long length of copper, so we can just slice them into little pieces. Uh, Matthew printed over on the engineering, shh, over on the engineering 3D printer, he printed a, co a plastic copper sample holder. So this was designed in conjunction with an engineer that works with Edmond College. The engineer built a metal version, and Matthew printed a plastic version. It takes about a day to print it. It comes in three pieces, side, side, and then these rods to keep it um, solid on, on, and help hold the halves together. So we went through a bunch of designs. It took a little while to get this right. That plastic is really brittle, so we learned all about the limitations of 3D printing. It's tricky, and it doesn't always work. Copper is heavy, so this causes the, 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 the structure to bow a little bit. Nonetheless, it worked great. And then uh, he found on Amazon that you can just buy nickel copper fabric. And it, I swear to God, it feels like shirt cloth. It's metal. It's all metal. But it feels, it's so finely woven in thin strands that it feels like a real cloth. You can make a shirt out of this stuff. So we took to calling this Mithril because we're nerds. And that's the famous metal from Lord of the Rings that uh, uh, Frodo's uh, coat, well, uh, originally Bilbo, I guess, if you're going to be specific about it. But the coat of armor that they have that goes underneath his shirt that protects him from stab wounds is made of this uh, uh, dwarvish. Anyone want to jump in and help me here? Dwarvish metal called Mithril? Yeah? Yeah, thank you for admitting that you're a Tolkien fan. OK. So uh, what we did was we, uh, Matthew cut. Uh, five squares, and then Maisha, the other student that, uh, that was working on the, the nitrogen uh, uh, blowing project, uh, she, she can sew, and she can sew really well, so she just used fishing line, an insulator, to sew all this metal together. Took about a night or two, so she just watched TV and sewed, uh, and it was beautiful. And it, it, it's perfectly electrically continuous all throughout. We tested it with a little probe to make sure that it's a solid electrical surface. So that, that little cap goes over the holder. The holder goes in the pressure cooker. That gets hooked up to a big electric potential difference. The walls of the pressure cooker are grounded. So now there's a big electric field inside the pressure cooker. And then we wanted to see what would happen. We, that's our power supply. It goes up to 35,000 volts. Uh, direct current, although we don't care about current. We just want the field. There's our pressure cooker. And this, is, this was all being done inside of a fume hood in one of the chemistry student labs downstairs. So the chem department was really nice. They let us use that over spring break because there are no labs going on. Uh, Matthew did a whole bunch of calculations to see if we expected the radon daughters to be stopped. So he did what you did. He just used introductory physics to calculate whether or not this electric field could stop the radon. We expected some effect, but we didn't know how much. Well, here's the effect. This actually came as a surprise to us. So if you do nothing, if you just put the electric field experiment together and run it and let the copper get exposed to radon, but you don't put the field on, so you just let it cook in the radon, you get a certain level of contamination. And if you then take the copper plates out, you put them in an instrument that can count their contamination levels, that contamination dies off over five days as an exponential decay. So it's just a nuclear decay law. 
So what you're seeing here on a logarithmic scale is the declining radioactive contamination of the copper after it's been exposed. This down here, there are actually two data points down here, although it's hard to separate them even on that inset. If you turn the electric field on, and we could only get it to 6,000 volts, after that we got arcing inside of the uh, vessel. It was cool. You get, it's like, you know, shields up and then lightning just shoot, shoots out of the anode into the walls of the vessel. But that, that means the electric field is not really working in there, and that's making a ton of ozone. So we didn't want that at first. So we only operated it at six kilovolts, so we didn't get an ozone, big ozone smell, thus the fume hood, okay? Uh, and it reduced the radon contamination of the copper plates by a factor of 35, which was a big deal. And it was as good as blowing nitrogen over the copper. So if you combine nitrogen and electric field, this may be a great way to protect equipment in the future for these next generation of experiments. So anyway, that's, that's what we did. So it's just electric fields, charged particles, and cross your fingers and hope some science comes out of it. And it worked out. Uh, we got the data four days before the poster was to be presented. So we were really cramming this in at the end. So here's uh, Matthew on the right and Maisha on the left. They had a crowd of people at their poster almost the whole night of the poster session. The poster session at this conference is a big deal. Uh, they had something like 30 or 40 posters. They put a whole spread of food out and everybody from the conference goes to it. So they really try to make this a big deal. And they pretty continuously had a group of people asking them questions all night. This guy right here, he was great. He's like, I don't know why you're going to want to do a stupid experiment like this. No one's going to want to put a big electric field like that around their equipment. And we're like, okay, well, fine. I guess you're not our competition then. So, <laughs> uh, you know, naysayers are fine, but, uh, you know, go out and do it, right? So, so, uh, so yeah, this is the middle of a good crowd with Maisha and, uh, uh, Maisha and Matthew kind of leading the, uh, the crowd through the various aspects of the poster. Um, so, uh, Ma Maisha is a physics, bio, math, triple major, and as I said, uh, Matthew is an engineering, electrical engineering and physics dual major. Uh, and Maisha has been doing research with uh, Dr. Cooley since her first year in college. So, uh, we didn't only work while we were there. Uh, the cherry trees were blossoming at the University of Washington while we were there, and it was gorgeous. Like, the whole campus just smelled like cherry blossoms. So, so this was great. You know, you, we don't get to see this down here. And uh, that's, it's a little hard to see. But that's Mount Rainier. And in the photo, it's really neat because there's a, there's a draft over Mount Rainier. That, and so there's a big cloud layer that's kind of sliding over Mount Rainier like water over a, a rock. It's uh, really quite wild. So this is a, a walkway at the University of Washington right by the conference venue uh, near the library. They have these cherry trees down to a, a little pool and then Mount Rainier right at the end of the, uh, the aisle. It's really gorgeous. So if you're ever in Seattle, I highly recommend uh, going to the campus. It's, it's really beautiful. Okay, one other thing you might be interested in, shameless uh, promotion within my family here. So uh, my spouse, Professor Jody Cooley, will be on Science Friday this Friday from 2.20 to 3 p.m. local time. Uh, she got the pre-interview last Thursday and they decided to run with her on a panel. So she'll be on a panel with Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg and maybe one or two other people. And it's a 40-minute segment. They normally do 20 minutes per segment. Uh, so if you want to see what they have to talk about, they just did a special on Science Friday on 100 years since Einstein's theory of ge general relativity came into being. Uh, and now they're apparently going to do kind of a perspective forward. What are the big questions people are working on now going into the next like 50 or 100 years? Uh, so anyway, enjoy. Uh, I'm, I know I will. So apparently she's going to do this for some studio here on campus. So she won't be on the on a phone with people knocking on her door asking, uh, Professor Cooley, can you tell me where the bathroom is? Uh, Professor Cooley, can you sign up for the major? So, okay. Any questions? I thought not. Yeah. All right. So let's solve some problems involving magnetic fields and charges. Okay. So this is to make up for not having done any problem solving for a couple of weeks now. Uh, so the basic principles here, just again, reviewing the, the basics. Electric charge exists in two kinds, positive and negative. These exert influence on each other by, by a field of force. We've now really kind of dug into that field and its associated potential, its uh, electric potential. Uh, these fields accelerate charges. That's the whole basis of circuitry. So you create a voltage, you move some current, you do some work, you get some good stuff out on the other end, okay? Uh, we've looked at capacitors, we've looked at resistors, we've looked at batteries. So we've kind of, you know, looked at basic circuits. Magnetic fields, which seem at first weirdly independent of electric fields, they're fields of force exerted by certain materials, such as magnetite and iron. They also, though, affect electric charges. 
However, they don't do this linearly. An electric field accelerates an electric charge along or against its field lines, depending on the sign of the charge. But what's weird about magnetic fields is that the, the acceleration doesn't change the magnitude of the velocity, but it does change its direction. And so a charged particle's trajectory will be bent perpendicular to the, both the magnetic field and its original direction of motion. And I can demonstrate that right now. So it seems weird at first. And what's tricky about magnetic fields is you have to build up a little toolkit of comfort with working with things that happen at right angles to one another. All right? So cross products become a big deal. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you some simple rules to remember for cross <coughs> products to help you do those today. Hopefully quickly, easily, and quietly. Okay. Uh, I have a video on the, we on the class website called the Confidently Calculating a Cross Product. I made it years ago. It uses what's known as the matrix method of calculating the cross product. But there's another method I've adopted in the meantime that I personally prefer because it's purely algebraic. And you just have to remember one rule. And once you remember that one rule, you basically can reproduce all cross products pretty quickly. Okay? So I'll walk you through that in a moment. But I thought it would be nice to do the in-class demonstration of bending charge with a magnetic field. So let me get rid of this and bring up camera two. Okay, so camera two is just aimed at this device. This is a Crooks tube. You saw this being operated in one of the lecture videos. This was the device that J.J. Thompson used to discover the existence of the electron. Okay, and essentially it looked very similar to this. You have uh, uh, a metal plate that can emit electrons. This piece of metal right here is just, it has a little slot. Let me turn this to the side. Okay, so you can see that little slot right there. That's just meant to um, filter out electrons heading off at stray angles and create a little almost um, rectangular beam coming through the slot. So it's a filter. It's a filter for <coughs> electrons to make a nice rectangular beam of them. Okay. The, the white plate on the back here, it's tipped at a little angle. It's just meant to help you see the beam. Because normally you can't see electrons with your eyes. Your eyes are sensitive to visible light, not electrons. How you see electrons at all is because when they interact with gas atoms inside this tube, they emit a bluish light. And so your eye sees the light, but it never sees the electron. And this is something you need to get comfortable with. Right? It, you may be more comfortable than previous generations of people with this, but you can't see everything in the cosmos. And so you have to use technology in order to bring it into the visible realm for human beings. And that means a very narrow spectrum of light that we are sensitive to with our eyes. So you have to use tricks to do this. You have to use gases or electronics or something to convert the invisible into the visible. Electrons are not visible, but their effects on matter can be visible to human beings. So let me just fire this up. So this is a roughly 50 kilovolt power supply. We don't need a lot of juice to get electrons to move. It doesn't take a big field to move electrons. So there you go. As I promised, a bluish light. That light is the result of a beam of electrons trying to get from the high potential on one side to the low potential on the other. Uh, and that light results as they smack into gas atoms inside of this sealed tube. Right? So this is just filled with some gas that gives off a bluish light when electrons interact with the electrons in the atoms. Okay? They excite them and then de-excite them, and when they de-excite, they give off light. Okay? So very simple. Uh, I have the camera at an angle, so the beam looks like it's at a little angle. Let me intensify that a bit. All right? So we just crank up the voltage a little bit, get a nice bright blue light out of this. Now, let me demonstrate bending with a magnetic field. I have the rare earth magnet in my hand. I'm going to put one pole in such an orientation that the magnetic field lines that come out of this end of the magnet, they will point into the plane of that screen. So the velocity of the electron beam is to the left, all right, along the horizontal. I'm going to point the magnet so that its magnetic field lines are perpendicular to the plane of the screen and thus perpendicular to the motion of the electron beam. And when I do this, you should see the beam bend. It's easy to see up on the screen. That is the magnetic force <coughs> on charged particles. And in fact, if you couple this 
with an electric field, which we have done here, you have just made a particle accelerator. This is essentially a small version of a medical linear accelerator. You, if you need to accelerate electrons to get them uh, up to speed to smash into a cancer tumor, you use a power supply like that, although it'll be on steroids. Okay? If you want to bend the beam to aim it better or to steer it around corners into the treatment area, you need magnets. Magnets are the lenses of charged particles. They allow you to steer beams. Now, if I flip the magnet around and put the other pole, I can bend down. So with just this simple change, flipping the pole around, I can change the direction that I'm uh, steering this beam of subatomic particles. And that is the entire basis of my field. It, I can summarize it in exactly one demonstration. Electric fields to accelerate particles, magnetic fields to bend them. And this allows fine-grained control of the subatomic world as long as it carries electric charge. If that was a beam of neutral particles, like neutrons, nothing would happen. They don't respond to magnetic fields because they don't, yeah, they don't have charge. Okay. Now, so any questions on that? That is, uh, that is the magnetic force on charged particles right there. Okay. And we can summarize that <coughs> at the particle level as the force due to a magnetic field is the charge okay, times the velocity of the particle crossed with the magnetic field direction. All right? and I'm going to do cross product in a second here. If you are talking about a current, this just changes to this formula. The current, coulombs per second, times this vector L. And all L does is it's a vector its magnitude is the length of the wire, let's say, that's carrying the current, and its direction is the direction the current is traveling. And remember, current is the direction of positive charge flow. Current is the direction of positive charge flow. So if you have an electron beam going to the left, then you have a positive charge beam really going to the right. All right. So electrons going to the left are really like positive charges going to the right. Keep that in mind as you work problems with this. Okay, let's look at this cross product. So let me uh, get rid of this. And bring this back up. Okay, so let's look at the cross product. This is something which seems very scary at first. The basic properties of the cross product are that if you have two vectors, A and B, just generic, and you take the cross product, you get a third vector from this, C. Now, the third vector, C, will always be perpendicular to A and perpendicular to B. That is, if you take C dot A, you will get zero. So if you take the dot product of C and A, which tells you the projection of C along A, the shadow that that vector casts along A, the answer is, None, no shadow. There is no component of C that lies along A. That's the definition of the cross product. And similarly, C dot B will equal zero. So the great thing about the cross product is it's guaranteed to return a vector that makes exactly 90 degree angles with the other two. They may not make 90 degree angles with respect to each other, but as long as they're not parallel, then you will get a third vector that results from it, and that third vector will always be perpendicular to the first two. So it's a great little piece of technology in mathematics. And the magnitude of the cross product, so if we want to know the magnitude of C, that's the magnitude of A, so the length of A, the magnitude of B, the length of B, and the sine of the angle between them. So if I have here A and B, and that's theta in between them, if I want to know the magnitude of C, so if I have um, uh, A and B and then C, okay, C makes right angles with both A and B, so those are 90 degree angle, 90 degree angle, and the magnitude of C is given by this. It's the length of A, the length of B times the sine of the angle between them. All right, so it looks very similar to the dot product, which is if you do the dot product of A and B, you get A times B times cosine theta. 
All right, so again, if A and B have no angle between them, if they are parallel to each other, the sine of zero is? Louder? Zero. Zero, yeah. So if they are parallel, you get no cross product. There is no vector that is perpendicular to both of them at the same time. Actually, there's an infinity of vectors that's perpendicular to them when they both point along the same line, because you could have a vector here, or here, or here, or here, or here. So the cross product essentially returns nonsense. It says no. There's, there's no vector you can make that's perpendicular to both of those. Don't try to trick me, OK? So the vector, the cross product is smarter than me. Let me put it that way, all right? Um, now, how do you figure out whether C points this way or, or up like that? Uh, that is where it's helpful to have a little thing called a right-hand rule, OK? So you can figure out, using the fingers on your right hand, you can figure out which way that vector C is going to point. Now, there are many variations on the right-hand rule. Let me walk you through two of them. Okay? I prefer the second one, but I'll do the first one first. So take your index finger, point it straight forward. Take your thumb, point it straight up. Take your middle finger and point it at 90 degrees to both of those. Okay? So X, Y, Z. You basically have a little, you know, this, you know, this is how you know you're in the physics club. I told you when you start doing this, this is how you know you've made it, okay? So you start doing this to solve problems, and you're like sitting there and writing. You know. If you're left-handed, I apologize, uh, but this is a mirror universe where everything is reversed and screwed up. Don't, don't do this, <laughs> okay? This is the mirror image of this. Don't, don't, don't do the left-hand rule. You'll get wrong answers from it, okay? So it's a convention. You have to stick with it. I apologize to the left-handed people, all right? So you have this little thing, x, y, z. This is how you can remember Cartesian axes, OK? So your finger points along x, your middle finger points along y, your thumb points along z. That's a Cartesian coordinate system, OK? We'll use that in a second. So if you want to figure out whether c points down or up, you take your index finger, point in the direction of a. Then you take your middle <coughs> finger, point in the direction of b. So I have a like this. b points kind of out of the board that way. And then your thumb indicates where C would point. And here it points down. That's why I drew this down. If A were here and B were here, and I did A cross B, then I would point this way. My finger, my middle finger points in the direction of B. My thumb then points up. OK, so if you reverse the cross product, if you do A cross B, it points this way. If you do B cross A, it points that way. OK, so you can flip signs around by swapping the order of the cross product, so be careful with that. Here's the other one. Okay, this is the one I actually prefer because I feel like it goes faster. You take all of the fingers on your right hand and you point them in the direction of A, you curl them toward the direction of B, and your thumb points in the direction of C. All right, so uh, A, B, <coughs> C, get the same answer. A, curl toward B, C. If B were into the board, I'd have to go A, B, and then C would point out. OK, so this takes a little bit of thinking in three dimensions, and it's tricky. Practice it if you're not good at it. Not everybody is. I sucked at thinking in three dimensions until I was like late in graduate school. It was very hard for me to do this sort of thing. Um, luckily, I like to draw. So drawing things help me a lot. And if drawing things helps you, do it. OK, don't, don't rely on something that isn't working for you. Do something else. So if drawing works better or just remembering the rules I'm going to show you in a moment works better, just do those, OK? OK, how do you calculate a cross product? And how do you do it quickly? Uh, I'm going to show you the trick, and it's based on the coordinate axes. Okay, So let's imagine that you have a vector a, which is equal to, let's say, a1 i hat plus a2 j hat. Okay. And then you have a vector b, which is equal to um, b1, let's see, uh, j hat. OK? And you want to find c vector, which is a cross b. OK? So very generic. These could be, you know, this could be velocity, and you have to multiply it by charge. This could be magnetic field, and then you take the cross products of QV cross B. This is just a placeholder for any calculation like that. Okay. All right, well, let's just start by writing this down like algebra. Okay. So this is going to be A1 I hat plus A2 J hat crossed with uh, B1 J hat. Now, the cross product 
is like any other multiplication. You can distribute. Okay, so if, so if I had something like this, if I had a1 plus a2 b1, you would just say, oh, well, that's a1 b1 plus a2 b1. You would just distribute, okay? Same thing works here. Just make sure you keep the cross product sign when you distribute. So this can be written as a1 i hat cross b1 j hat plus a2 j hat cross b1 j hat. So all I did was distribute. That's it. So I went one more algebraic step forward. Okay, now this is where the handy little rules come in. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the handy little rules. And I like this because this is, this is just pure algebra. Okay, let me uh, slide that over for a second. Okay, you've got i hat, you've got something i hat cross with something j hat. So these are a1 and b1. They're just numbers. They just multiply these little unit vectors. You can pull them all out in front. It doesn't change anything. Okay, so let me do that. Let me, let me just, for this term right here, let me just write this as a1, b1, and then in parentheses, <coughs> i hat cross j hat. Okay, so all I did is I pulled those numbers out. All right, and that's fine to do. You know, for instance, if you had something like um, A, B times C, D, and these were all numbers, you would have no qualms about saying, oh, well, I could rewrite this as A, C, B, D, right? Because they just, they're just multiplying each other. You can multiply them in any order and pull them out. You have to be careful with vectors. So these are the vectors. Leave them crossed into one another. But you can take those numbers that multiply them and just pull them out in front like one big number. Okay? No harm in that. It's if you start messing with the cross product without using the rules that you'll get into trouble. So here are the rules. This is how I remember it. I hat cross j hat equals k hat. The x direction crossed with the y direction equals the z direction. And you can see that right with the right hand rule, right? x cross y equals z. That's it. That's the definition of a co Cartesian coordinate system. In fact, a right-handed Cartesian coordinate system is defined by exactly that equation. The cross product of x and y yields z. It's perpendicular to both x and y. And of course, x and y are perpendicular to each other. Okay. The next thing you do with this to get all the other rules is something that's called permutation in mathematics, but you can just think of it as the conveyor belt. The conveyor belt, imagine these symbols are sitting on a little conveyor belt, okay? And they're attached to the conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt rotates clockwise, okay? So what happens is K gets yanked off the end, transported around here and plopped at the beginning, and J gets moved over to its spot, and I gets moved over to where J was. All right, little conveyor belt. So this equation is also true. K cross I equals J. This is called permuting the order. That is, you just shift them all by one, and you take the one on the end and put it back at the beginning. And this is called a permutation. Okay? That's the fancy math term. You can just, I like to think of it as a conveyor belt for these little symbols. All right, this is how I remember this. You can do it again. You can move J to the beginning, slide K over one, slide I over one. Leave those operators in the same place, okay? So J cross K equals I. Yeah, Julius. Um, so in this case, you, you'd have to like literally leave them in their specific place. Like you couldn't say I times K equals J. Let's look at that. Okay, so uh, like this one here. Yeah. Okay, so what happens if you swap any pair? And the answer is you pay a penalty of a single minus sign. This, so the first three are easy to remember. You just do the conveyor belt. I, J, K, K, I, J, J, K, I, okay? If you want to get J cross I, K, or I cross K, K cross J, all you have to do is put a minus sign in. So J cross I equals negative K hat. That's it. I cross K equals negative j hat. And finally, k cross j 
equals negative i hat. And those are the six rules. And you can get them all from the first one. So to get the next two, you just do the conveyor belt. To get the last three, you swap the order of any two of these and put a minus sign on the other side. That's it. Now there's one more set of rules, but they turn out to be sort of the silliest and easiest to remember. If you have I cross I, J cross J, or K cross K, you're taking a vector and asking what's the cross product of it with itself, and the answer is, what's that? Zero. There is no vector that's perpendicular to two parallel vectors. I is parallel to itself. There is no single vector that is perpendicular to both it and itself. Okay? So these are all zero, zero, zero. I cross I, J cross J, K cross K, zero. Okay? So anytime one of those symbols appears with itself in a cross product, gone. That's what's great about this. Okay? So let's go back and revisit our little cross product using these rules. I have A1, B1, those are just numbers, I hat cross J hat. Okay, well I go over here and I look, I hat cross J hat is K hat. So this is A1, B1, K hat. Okay, and then finally I have this one. I have A2, B1, <laughs> J hat cross J hat. And J hat cross J hat is zero. Great. So that term just goes away. Gone. Not even interesting. So that's what's nice about this. You can right away recover, even take the most complicated vectors and start doing cross products with them. And like stuff will cancel out pretty fast. And then you have to group your terms that don't cancel out. Okay. So we find out that, that um, C is equal to A1, B1, K hat. That's it. Done. Okay? No right hand rule needed. It's all built into this stuff. It's all built into this stuff. All right? So, I, J, K. I cross J equals K. Do the conveyor belt trick to get these two. Swap any pair on the left, put a minus sign on the right to get the other three, and you're done. Okay? And then any of them crossed with themselves, zero. Questions? So we can start doing problems now. Okay, let's do some problems. Or not. There we go. Okay, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, had to shamelessly sneak one of these in. So the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, LHC, accelerates uh, beams of protons, and each beam of protons is taken up to a total momentum uh, of these funny units. And I'll walk you through them in a second. 6.5 tera electron volts divided by C, where C is the speed of light. Now, believe it or not, you can work through it. This is a unit of momentum, okay? Um, you can convert electron volts to joules, and C is just meters per second. And if you kind of work through that, you'll see that you get kilogram meters per second, which is momentum, okay? So it's just a funny way of writing momentum. But it's very standard in particle physics, my field. Medical physics as well, okay? Estimate the strength of magnets required to maintain these beams in an orbit. Well, here's the orbit. The beams <coughs> make a 27-kilometer circle over the French-Switzerland border in a tunnel that's about 100 to 150 meters under the ground. So um, we have a, a, a radius for this 27-kilometer circle of 4.3 kilometers. All right, so 4,300 meters. We want to estimate the strength of the magnets required to maintain the beams in that circular orbit. All right? We can assume the proton motion is at a 90 degree angle to the magnetic field lines. So let's, let's see what that means. Okay, we're, that's a nice hint. Anytime you have that, the, pro, the problem has been greatly <laughs> simplified for you. All right, so let's take a look at that. Let's start with the force on a single proton. The force on a single proton will be equal to the charge of the proton, which is just the elementary charge, E, times its velocity vector crossed into the magnetic field. Okay? Well, we don't know the velocity vector, but we are given the momentum. So we, we could figure it out. 
but you'll see why actually it's convenient to be given the momentum in a minute. We're told that the velocity and the uh, magnetic field lines make 90 degree angles with respect to each other. So we already know something. If we write the magnitude of Fb, we have E, magnitude of V, magnitude of B, sine theta. Theta is 90 degrees, and the sine of 90 degrees is? Zero. One. one. Yes, it's one. Better not be zero, or this is like the shortest problem. And why would I do this? <laughs> You're right, we're done, zero. We don't use magnets at all. It was a trick question. All right, so, so sine of 90 is zero. Uh, it's one. Now, nah, see, look at that. You screwed me up. I'm not putting a dollar in the jar. That was your fault. Whoever said zero. Okay. So this is great. Sine of 90 degrees is one. So that's just one. And the magnitude of this is just E magnitude of V magnitude of B. Well, we're looking for the magnitude of the magnetic field. Okay, so we want that thing. We want B. But we don't know V and we don't know F. We don't know the force. But the other piece of information here is that this is a circle, that these protons are maintained in a circular orbit. And in fact, this is done for 10, 12 hours at a time. Okay. So in circular motion, there's another force. What is that force called? Centripetal. centripetal right. It's holding you in the circle. All right. And centripetal force, its magnitude, the magnitude of centripetal force, <coughs> is m v squared over r. So the mass of the thing moving in a circle times its velocity squared divided by the radius of that circle. We can equate these two things because if it's being held in a circle by the magnetic fields, these things must be equal to one another. Okay? So we can say, well, this is just equal to E V B. Where I've just now taken the shortcut of writing the magnitude of the velocity is V, the magnitude of the magnetic field is B. Well, this is great, because now we have velocity squared on one side and velocity on the other. So we can cancel one of these. And we're left with just B equals MV all over ER. So mass times velocity divided by charge times the radius of the circle. Okay? What's M times V equal to? <coughs> Thanks. Yep. Momentum. That's right. Thank you, Finley. That's just P. Now, a cautionary tale here. We are doing what's called classical physics. And in classical physics, it's OK to exceed the speed of light. And actually, if you calculate the speed of these protons, you'll find out that they, in classical physics, they're in excess of the speed of light, which actually is not allowed. But it's OK. All right. It actually, it does change the answer from the correct answer in reality. But uh, we're not going to worry about that, because I'm not introducing relativity to save this, this calculation. It's not worth it. That's like two weeks in and of itself. Okay. So we're just going to pretend right now that it's OK to go faster than the speed of light, which it's not. But pretend, okay? So uh, if you put in that momentum, we have to convert it. We have to convert its units. So 6.5 TeV divided by C. Six. What's that? Ten oh. power sixteen. For T. For T. Oh uh, no, T tera ten to the twelve. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is 6.5 times ten to the twelve EV divided <laughs> by C. One EV. Does anybody remember how many joules that is? It has a convenient conversion factor, but it's been a while. 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules is 1 EV. It happens to be exactly equal to the elementary charge. Okay. So all I have to do is, is say 6.5 times 10 to the 12 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Uh, well, that's what that is, joules. That's 1 EV is that many joules. And then you need to divide this by the speed of light, which is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, okay? So that'll give you kilogram meters per second. And since everything else here is in meters and coulombs and so forth, we gotta get this into meters, kilogram, second units, okay? These are particle physics units, but they can be converted. Yeah. When it reduce speed of light, do you just want to do three, or do you want to see 2.998? <laughs> it's a, it's a four okay. yeah. it's okay. You can use three, that's fine. For the rounding that happens in this problem, it doesn't make a difference. So uh, I just, I'm just being pedantic, that's all. Okay. But that three decimal places is the limit of my pedanticism. Is that a word? I don't even know if that's a word. Okay. All right, so if you plug all that in, you'll find out that this is about five tenths.
Tesla. Now, in reality, to get to that energy, it's actually closer to 8 Tesla, and that's because of special relativity. So it, that's a whole separate thing in and of itself. But, but this is pretty close. I mean, you're in the ballpark with this answer. We actually have 8 Tesla magnetic fields, but 5 is, yeah, close enough. So, um, yeah. What's the relationship between C and the uh, Oh, that, oh, C. This is C. So C equals this. So C, 1 C, 1 times the speed of light, is 2.998 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Yeah. And in the, in the real world, it's as fast as we think anybody anything can actually travel. Uh, but here, if you do the math, you'll find that the protons appear to be in excess of the speed of light. But that's because I've neglected relativity here completely. So, Okay, so, so using these kinds of things, you can very quickly figure out the engineering parameters for a system like this. Okay, so this is pretty close to the correct answer, which I said is about 8 tesla. Okay, uh, the LHC collides many bunches of protons. A single proton beam has a nominal current of 0.5 amps. So each beam is about you know, 0.6 amps of current. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that's um, 1.15 times 10 to the 11th protons per bunch, 2808 bunches around the ring for each beam, okay? So it's a lot of protons. And every time we collide one bunch of protons, about 10 to the 11 with 10 to the 11 other protons, we get a typical 40 proton-proton collisions, which we then have to tease one interesting one out of those 40. It's a nightmare. So this is why we have a big 100 megapixel digital camera that can take 40 million images a second. Okay, It's to catch the details of all of that collision stuff. All right, so what's the magnetic force experienced by this current? <coughs> all right, magnetic force for a current. That's a related equation. And again, the current and the magnetic fields are at right angles to each other. So the most generic equation is I L cross B. Okay. Uh, let's think about each of the pieces here. So we want to know the magnitude of the force. So the magnitude of the force is equal to I magnitude of L <coughs> magnitude of B sine of 90 degrees again, which is just 1. So just I L B. Okay. Uh, we know B now. It's 5 tesla. What's L? Well, L is just the length of the current. Uh, yeah? Did we not have to divide by E in the radius of the circle? You did. I just left that out of the... Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't explicitly Sorry. put those in. I just converted 6.5 TeV over C and into okay. kilogram meters in seconds. Yeah, that's all. That's all. Yeah, so e down here you'd have... Uh, another, you know, E, which is 1.6, 10 to the minus 19, and then this would be 4.3 e times 10 to the 3 meters. Yeah. So if you put all that together in a calculator, you should get 5 tesla out of it. Well, is it wouldn't be negative in that case? Like you wouldn't have to put, since it's an electron? Uh, protons. Um. So it's positive, <coughs> yeah. And it, anyway, it's a magnitude, and the magnitude is always a positive number. If you were asked, <coughs> however, for the direction, then you have to worry about sign. Okay. All right, so the length of the, the current here is just the circumference of the circle. So L is 2 pi r. Okay, so it's just the length of that red circle. Okay, and uh, if you plug all that in, we were given I. It's 0 0.58 amps. We're given the radius, 4.3 kilometers, so 4,300 meters. And uh, we know the magnetic field from the first part. Uh, so this comes out to actually be a pretty big force. I mean, for protons, this is immense. The magnitude of this is 7.8 times 10 to the 4 newtons. Those protons really want to go in a straight line. And to keep them from going in a straight line at that energy takes an immense magnetic field, <coughs> exerting an immense amount of force on this. All right, I'd like to have you guys do some problems now. So there's, a, there's some bonus stuff in here that I'll put in the notes. Uh, given the current flowing around the Large Hadron Collider and its radius, what's its magnetic dipole moment? I mean, after all, that current, one of those beams, is a big loop. And the area of that loop is pretty large. So you can actually calculate the magnetic dipole moment by just taking I times A, and it's a big number. Okay, And then you could do something like, well, loops of current are subject to torque from an external magnetic field. And there is a big external magnetic field here, the Earth. It doesn't seem very strong, but you can calculate the torque due to the 57 millitesla field uh, present at that location on the Earth. Okay, I looked up the map this morning. 
uh, and it has that magnetic field dips into the Earth at about 62 degrees. So the magnetic field is actually penetrating that area at an angle uh, that makes a non-zero cross product with the dipole moment. And you can calculate the torque, and it's a big torque. But it's also a really huge machine with a lot of rock around it. So, so the question is, does it matter? <laughs> but you get a big number out of this. It's actually a surprisingly large number that that dinky little magnetic field exerts on that giant, giant dipole moment right there. So, okay. So I just wanted to show you guys, this is what the dipoles actually look like. The proton beams travel through those holes there. They're counter circulating. So one goes into the board, one, go one goes into the page, one comes out of the page. And this is what the magnetic fields look like due to this sort of funky superconducting design here. So you have all these superconducting wedges and they generate magnetic fields. We'll learn about that in the next section of the course. And the sum of all those magnetic fields is a nice uniform uh, straight uh, magnet, uh, magnetic field that we can use for bending, okay? So that keeps the protons from wandering out of their orbit. Okay, so here's your problem. A little biology, a little space. All right, so long duration space flights, that is like a mission to Mars, which um, both private and public uh, entities are talking about doing in the next two to three decades. It's actually quite a medically challenging thing. And not only for the reasons you think of, like food, loneliness, and so forth, but um, the threat of biological damage to astronauts from the solar wind is actually a huge issue. Uh, the solar wind consists of ejected charged particles from the sun, and we're largely protected from it on Earth because of our magnetic field. But if you just hurl a rocket into space far from Earth, into the, the space between Earth and Mars, let's say, uh, that journey can take upwards of you know, a year or two to happen. Uh, and meanwhile, that ship, apart from whatever <coughs> metal it has built into it, is subject to a huge uh, uh, wind of charged particles from the sun. And uh, estimates have been done that not only would this induce a high cancer rate in astronauts, um, it can actually degrade brain matter uh, because you're just being bombarded by charged particles. So your cognitive functioning may decrease rapidly over the years of exposure to the solar wind, not, not the stuff they talk about on Star Trek, right? Although they do have this thing called the Bassard Ram Scoop that they used to, never mind, it's a technical detail. Anyway, I'm such a nerd. All right, so, uh, so imagine you're an astronaut, you're in this you know, habitat that's traveling to Mars. People have asked the question, could we use really big magnetic fields, and then if big, how big, to protect astronauts from charged particle radiation? So, you know, literally shields, right? So shields up. Um, so imagine trying to use magnetic fields to deflect high energy electrons from the solar wind. All right, so I took a look at, you know, sort of the, the energy spectrum of these electrons, and, you know, getting toward the bad end of things, <coughs> Uh, these electrons have um, momenta of about 100,000 electron volts divided by C. So 100 keV divided by C. Um, so the question is here, first of all, what direction does the magnetic field in the hull point along X? Here's X, okay, that's X. Here's Y, and here's Z. And again, it's a right-handed coordinate system, okay? Um, what direction does the, the magnetic field have to point along X? Is it positively along X or negatively along X? If an electron entering along the positive, that's supposed to be the y direction, that's off the screen, but the positive y direction, so here comes, or positive z, sorry, electron comes in on the positive z direction and then is deflected back out by the magnetic field. Um, what direction does the magnetic field have to point? So try to use the right hand rule to figure that out, okay? And then finally, what strength magnetic field is needed in order to deflect that 100 keV divided by c solar wind electron? from the astronaut quarters. And um, you can let V and B be perpendicular, all right? So they can be initially perpendicular to one another, no problem. And here's a hint. If you're gonna deflect this electron, you don't want it to get inside and like graze the foot of the astronaut who might be standing there and then give them foot cancer, okay? So you want those electrons to stop before they hit the inside of the floor. So you definitely want the bending radius of the electron when it comes into the magnetic field and then is bent away. You want that to be no greater than the thickness of the hull, okay, or wherever you have the magnetic field. So um, here the hull plating is one meter thick. Okay, so your bending radius is one meter. Okay, so how about it? Gang up a little bit. You've got 10-ish you know, minutes uh, to play around with this. Uh, see how far you can get. So try a right-hand rule first to figure out the answer to the part A. And then for part B, do a little calculation and see what kind of magnetic field strength is required 
to deflect these. And keep in mind, the, the biggest magnetic fields that humans know how to make right now are LHC magnetic fields, eight and a half Tesla. That's the biggest magnetic field any human being knows how to make reliably right now. See what you get, okay?